Well, the House of Representatives sent a message, a bipartisan message, and it was pro-Israel. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. The right to boycott is deeply rooted in the fabric of of our country. What was the Boston Tea Party but a boycott? Where would we be now without the boycott led by civil rights activists in the 1950s and 60s, like the Montgomery Bus Boycott and the United Farm Workers Grape Boycott? That was the voice of Representative Rashida Tlaib, one of the so-called squad members, speaking out in favor of the BDS movement. The House sent a strong message back. We'll talk about that. Welcome to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. This is Michael Brown. Delighted to be with you. Here's the number to call, 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-348-7884. Any Jewish-related question of any kind, And to all the critics who post ugly anti-Semitic comments day and night on our YouTube channel, give me a call and defend one of your accusations against Israel or the Jewish people or the Talmud. Love to have a civil discussion. At least I'll pledge civility on my end. 866-348-7884. And looks like we are back live streaming on YouTube after being banned from doing so for a week. We'll talk to you about that more in a moment. But shout out to all of our friends watching in on YouTube. Glad to have you back. All right. In the midst of the rising tide of anti-Semitism in America, in a very real way, in a tangible way, in a way that has even led to bloodshed, violence, In the midst of that, there has been great concern as some of the members of the House of Representatives, elected governing officials, have come out with blatantly anti-Semitic comments, none more offensive than those of Representative Ilhan Omar. And there was a push from some of the newer House members to, to push forward with the BDS movement, to support the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement against Israel, which is really a movement to delegitimize Israel. And thankfully, the House overwhelmingly passed a resolution condemning the movement to boycott Israel. The vote vote was 398 to 17. Now, of course, to the anti-Semites, this will be further proof that, you see, the Jews own Congress, the Jews own the Senate and the House. To those who are thinking rationally, Thank God for this resolution. It doesn't say you're not allowed to participate in the BDS movement or believe in it, but it is condemning the movement. And the language specifically in the bill says this, the resolution that the Boycott Israel movement promotes principles of collective guilt, mass punishment, and group isolation, which are destructive of prospects for progress towards peace. New York Times article quotes uh, Ted Deutsch, Democrat of Florida, backer of the resolution. He said, but BDS doesn't seek social justice. It seeks a world in which the state of Israel doesn't exist. That, That is the bottom line. Let me read some of the text of this resolution. And then I want to play some shocking comments from Representative Rashida Tlaib in favor of the BDS movement. So House Resolution 246, opposing efforts to delegitimize the state of Israel and the global boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement targeting Israel. Uh, The resolution says this, whereas the democratic Jewish state of Israel is a key ally and strategic partner of the United States, whereas since Israel's founding in 1948, Congress has repeatedly expressed our nation's unwavering commitment to the security of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, Whereas American policy has long sought to bring peace to the Middle East and recognize that both the Israeli and Palestinian people should be able to live in safe and sovereign states, free from fear and violence, with mutual recognition. Where support for peace between the Israelis and Palestinians has longstanding bipartisan support in Congress. 
where it is the long-standing policy of the United States that a peaceful resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict should come through direct negotiations between the government of Israel and the Palestinian Authority with the support of countries in the region and around the world. It goes on with further statements like that. Then it resolves and says this, resolved that the House of Representatives opposes the global boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, BDS movement targeting Israel, including efforts to target United States companies that are engaged in commercial activities that are legal under United States law and all efforts to delegitimize the state of Israel. It affirms that the global boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement undermines the possibility for a negotiated solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by demanding concessions of one party alone and encouraging the Palestinians to regret, reject negotiations in favor of international pressure. It urges Israelis and Palestinians to return to direct negotiations as the only way to achieve an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Goes on with a few more things like that. Bottom line, bottom line, is it saying why the BDS movement is unjust? It is saying that the BDS movement seeks to delegitimize Israel as a nation and punish Israel as a nation and ultimately make it impossible for Israel to exist as a nation and puts pressure on one side alone, the House condemns the BDS movement. So Rashida Tlaib speaking out in favor of the BDS movement and saying why there should not be a resolution being passed had this to say. Americans boycotted Nazi Germany in response to dehumanization, imprisonment, and genocide of Jewish people. In the 1980s, many of us in this very body boycotted South African goods in the fight against apartheid. Oh, uh, this is a bit of a shocker. I, I read a transcript of her quotes first, and I thought, no, no, I'm getting something wrong here. Because it was one week ago that Representative Ilhan Omar stood up and made a similar speech. And, and she introduced a resolution defending the BDS movement, and she likened it to America boycotting Nazi Germany as the Nazis are slaughtering the Jews. And, and, and now here's a movement to delegitimize Israel, and she's saying, yeah, we should participate in this the same way we participated in boycotting the Nazis. So now the Israelis are the, the Nazis. One week later, Rashida Tlaib makes the exact same statement. Hey, we boycotted the Nazis in, 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 in the 40s. Then we should boycott Israel today. Uh, to call that tone deaf is an insult to people who are tone deaf. This is mind-bogglingly tone deaf. A, a glaring Jewish blind spot. Mind-bogglingly so. And, and here Tlaib wants to explain why this resolution condemning the BDS movement is wrong. Here's what she said. Our, free, our right to free speech is being threatened with this resolution. It sets a dangerous precedent because it attempts to delegitimize a certain people's political speech and to send a message that our government can and will take action against speech it doesn't like. Actually, no one's stopping free speech. She got up and said what she wanted. And every day of the week, people are speaking against Israel and they're supporting the BDS movement, saying what they want to say. No one is saying that you cannot speak out, according to this bill. It's saying that the House condemns the BDS movement. It is a resolution stating that. It is a resolution giving a position, and it's a good position. Here, Tlaib says, no, you're delegitimizing a people's ability to speak out, whereas this is delegitimizing a movement seeking to delegitimize Israel. You've got to realize that in the anti-Israel rhetoric, the BDS movement is not simply saying, look, we want equality in the region and we want just treatment. It is seeking to punish Israel. Any American company say that would be working with Israel, you've got to divest your, your, any investments you've made. You've got to divest. You've got to pull out. You can't be working with these companies, supporting them. You can't have your companies working in Israel. In other words, we want the collapse of the state of Israel. That would be the ultimate outcome of the BDS movement, and it makes no demands of the Palestinians. It, it, may, it doesn't recognize the other issues going on. It doesn't recognize how eager Israel has been to live in peace with the Palestinian neighbors if the Palestinians, the, the leadership, the radicals, whoever you want to say, would put down their murderous desires to wipe out Israel. So here, typical rhetoric. I'm, I'm looking at uh, an article here. Auschwitz is here in Palestine, says PA leader Jibril Rajub. 
So this is reported by palwatch.org, Palestinian Media Watch. So according to this former Jordanian minister on official PA TV, Palestinian Authority TV, Israel is a racist state rejecting the other in a Nazi Hitlerian manner. It has outdone what Hitler did. Auschwitz is here in Palestine. So, yeah, it's true that the Palestinians living in the so-called West Bank and Gaza experience some hardship because of their situation. Yes, it's true that they do not have all the liberties and freedoms that the Arabs living in Israel have. That's because of the Palestinian government. All right. But the bottom line is, even if Israel has not behaved perfectly, even if Israel could step up and do an even better job in its relations with the Palestinians, the fact is they have grown and thrived by the millions. They have gone from 200,000 roughly that stayed all right, and, and in the land within Israel, they've grown to about a million and a half. And those in Gaza, those in the, in the so-called West Bank, they have thrived and grown by the millions as opposed to the Germans, the Nazis, wiping out two-thirds of all European Jews. <clears throat> yes, the Nazis specifically being guilty of that. You're going to make a comparison. You're going to say Auschwitz is here in Palestine. Where, show me, please, the concentration camps where the Palestinians are being worked to death and, and put in gas chambers. Show me, please. Show me, please, where they are getting decimated, herded off in, in, in trains to their death. Please show me that. Show me where Israel is wiping out two out of every three Palestinians. Oh, yes, for sure. There are difficulties for the Palestinians living in Gaza and the West Bank. But I can assure you that if Hamas was not leading Gaza and if you had a peaceful, open minded Palestinian leadership that wanted to work with the Israelis, they would be thriving economically. They would be thriving socially. They would be thriving in so many other ways. And the same when it comes to the West Bank. Oh, no, Israel has been far from perfect. But to compare Israel to the Nazis, to compare what Israel has done in its relationship to the Palestinians, trying to stop terrorism from wiping them out, what Israel has done in response to compare that to the Nazis is utterly immoral. And for House representatives to get up and miss that is an absolute shocker. Thank God the House sent a message in response. Good news. All right, friends, phone lines are open. Got a bunch more to say about a bunch of other topics, but phone lines are open, 866 348 884. Any Jewish related call is welcome with. If you want to challenge anything I just said, call me. I want to present to you a unique way that you can partner together with me to reach Jewish people with the good news of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Hey, Paul wrote that the gospel is to the Jew first, but many of us don't know how to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. Can I tell you, we have a unique open door and Jewish people are ready to hear, but we need your help. When I was in Israel recently, my last hour in Jerusalem, about a dozen different people came up to me and they wanted to thank me for the impact of our message. One Jewish woman came up to me, a believer in Jesus. She said, you saved my son's life. He was falling away. He was getting pulled by other objections to Jesus. He read your material. He's back in the faith. A young man came up to me. He said he and his Orthodox Jewish friends, here he is, I mean, with the, with the yarmulke, the head covering, the traditional Jewish outfit, he said he and his Jewish friends, his Orthodox friends, watch my debates with rabbis. A few years ago, I was able to lead a Holocaust survivor to faith in Jesus. He was a brilliant man, an atheist who had fled the Holocaust. He read my books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, came to faith, led his wife to the Lord before they left this world. Friends, we have the resources. We have books ready to be translated in Hebrew to be distributed in Israel. We have our Real Messiah website, unique for reaching Jewish people, Orthodox Jews with the gospel, ready to be translated in Hebrew, ready to do internet campaigns to get into every home in Israel. Every cell phone in Israel can have this message, but we need your help. Every gift to our ministry will literally help us reach another Jewish person with the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Go to askdrbrown.org. AskDrBrown.org, and when you go there, we will partner together to bring salvation to Israel 
and the Jewish people. Together, we're making a great difference. Now is the time to reach the lost sheep of the House of Israel, to share in this end-time harvest of Jewish souls, and to find out how to receive this two-DVD set, Predestination, Election, and the Will of God Debate. Go to AskDrBrown.org and... 6634Truth. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, friends, to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. This is Michael Brown, 866-34-TRUTH. I'm, I'm holding a book in my hands. Uh, I'm not going to hold it up uh, completely. I'll, I'll let you just see the inside as I'm reading. Uh, the cover colors might not show properly with our backdrop here, but I'm, I'm excited. Just got this in my hands. Jezebel's War with America, the plot to destroy our country and what we can do to turn the tide. All of you who pre-ordered through our website, We'll be getting these signed and sent out in the next few days. I cannot wait to do that. Everyone else, if you've not yet pre-ordered, take my word for this one. Go to Jezebel'sWarWithAmerica.com. Jezebel'sWarWithAmerica.com. Go there today and pre-order. You can pre-order on Amazon or Christian Book, wherever you order. There are links to all those. And then when you pre-order, you'll immediately get the first three chapters sent you in PDF form. Then you'll get the ebook free. So you get the hardcover, the ebook free the day the book comes out. You'll also get the ebook of my book, Playing with Holy Fire, absolutely free. You'll get the mini ebook, Seven Secrets of the Real Messiah. You'll get two more videos, over $50 of free materials when you pre order. That's how strongly the publisher felt about this. I thought, you gotta be, you gotta be kidding me. You seriously wanna do all this? I said, fine, give away my stuff. I'm happy with it, but let's, let's get this out. So, uh, it's been a number one bestseller in advance on Amazon. We are thrilled with the response of those who've gotten uh, the copy in manuscript form and are reading it. So if you haven't pre-ordered, go to JezebelsWarWithAmerica.com. Book comes out August 6th, so limited time to take advantage of the pre-order special there. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Deborah in Minnesota. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, it's really almost embarrassing to live in Minnesota where Omar is supposedly representing us. Um, I just wish we could get her and her cohorts uh, put out of office. It's so uh, anti-Semitic and so evil. Hey, let, let me um, let me ask you a quick a quick question, Deborah. A Minnesota question. Sure. All right. The the critics of of Omar will often criticize President Obama as well, and say that there was a concerted effort to bring a lot of Somali immigrants into one part of the country so that they would then have a district and then they could then vote in a Muslim uh, representative and have a Muslim representative in the House. Wouldn't be the only one, but uh, that would that would be a reason for doing it. And that it was it was a planned thing. I'm glad we have refugees in the country. And if we can be a blessing and help to them, that's that's wonderful. But as someone living in Minnesota, it, is that talked about there? Is that just sound like some crazy conspiracy theory? Or do you hear that a lot from people in your state? Well, quite ironically, I happen to live in an apartment complex uh, where I am a minority, where the majority of the people here are Somali immigrants and other immigrants. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of um, (laughs) maybe even not fair for you to ask me that question. Um, It's very challenging, extremely difficult um, to be surrounded by Muslims and to see um, them being given rights and them being given um, rights. privileges and um, supports that even our own uh, like military and people are not given. Um, So challenging, uh, while we certainly do want to um, have people welcome in our nation who are here to bless this nation and be a a help to this nation, uh, I definitely have to experience a lot of the opposite. Yeah. Hey, look, you're you're in a mission field, though. You've got a great opportunity to share the gospel, right? I am, and it's yeah. been fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I sure, and, I sure need prayer. Yeah. So, uh, one more question, and then, and then, then back to you. Okay. So, okay. I fully support a group's right to come and, and practice their religion. For example, I support the right of Orthodox Jews, ultra Orthodox Jews, to live in their own communities and to say, "Hey, this is the way we practice our faith," and we're kind of insulated here. That's 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 fine. Just like you have the Amish, and they they live their way their their lifestyle. 
So if Muslims came together in a community and are practicing their faith, obviously that's perfectly fine. What would trouble me was if there was an anti-American attitude in the midst of it. If if there was yeah. if this was kind of fomenting things that were anti-Semitic or blatantly anti-American, that's what would concern me. So is that what you're seeing? Because again, Muslims practicing their faith, that's fine. They're welcome to do that in America. But do you see anything that would trouble you beyond that? Uh, yes, I do. Absolutely. Um, and again, I'm having to be a little bit guarded about how I speak uh, just because of in the midst of what I live. Uh, but no, there, there are definitely aspects going on there. Got it. Um, and All right. It is, it is being talked about. And I also do have to hear the flip side where people are just, we should let everybody hear what's the problem. And I'm like, well, you're not the one living in the midst of it. It's very, yeah, very Yeah, I mean, the, the goal of immigrants coming to America is that they become assimilated into our culture and that they become contributing members for the good of the culture as opposed to yeah. come here to be a counter- American force, uh, you know, that would obviously be not what we're welcoming them in as much as we want to help refugees in genuine need. Anyway, so your thoughts on, on the House resolution and the reason that you called? Okay, uh, would love to see this edited. Um, I'm actually looking at the copy of it right now. Um, um, and I want to comment that there is a Senator, Steve Scalise in Louisiana, who, who really would love to um, uh, see a different uh, anti-BDS uh, bill put through that has some better wording and some stronger wording um, uh, uh, that gives states and local governments a much stronger right to oppose uh, BDS. Um, my concern, of course, and I'm sure you saw this coming <laughs> because of things I've said before, but the very final line of this, it says, reaffirms its strong support for a negotiated solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resulting in two states. Yeah, two states. I, I democratic Got it. Yeah, I, I was looking down at that as I was reading, and that's something to discuss. And I, again, that's been the historic policy up until now. Many have yeah. argued that it's not viable, that it was never viable. Uh, Carolyn Glick in her One State Solution book, at the beginning of that, I often reference that because she's well known as, uh, as, as an Israeli spokesman, American Israeli spokeswoman. But she articulates clearly why she feels it would it would fail. But here's the flip side, though. From what I understand, the the Rashida Tlaibs and the Ilhan Omars support a one state solution, which in their mind would change the 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 very nature of the Israeli state. So that I think may be a pushback against some of their language. It, it's it's got to be explored more. I, I believe so. Yeah, it does, and I just would love to see this edited, and I would really encourage people to contact their senators and reps and, and really just ask for a, an edited version. We definitely want an anti-BDS bill, but just this one probably is not the perfect one. Yeah, well, so we're glad to see it because of the overwhelming support that it got, and it certainly provoked uh, a response. In other words, these freshman reps – pushing for something radical and saying, we want to support BDS. I mean, what were they, th what were they thinking? Do they believe that yeah. they could kind of say anything or do anything because they have this media favor and they're, they're the squad and all this? So they got hit with a dose of reality, obviously, because the response came back in a kind of tidal wave response. But I could say this, and, and rather than get into a complicated discussion, I could just say this, that the resolution would not have been one drop less decisive if it left out that final line. In other words, it talks enough about wanting to have a negotiated, peaceful resolution with the Israelis and the Palestinians, and they have to be the ones negotiating, etc. So all for that, uh, the issue to me would be that you don't need to add in that, that two-state line at the end. You, could, you, don't, you don't have to make that statement at all. It's, it's unrelated to the issues. Hey, Deborah. Thanks for calling, and may the Lord's grace be with you to be a shining witness for Jesus. 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. I've got this a problem with my email program where it constantly comes up with a box wanting me to sign in again, and I've been trying to get out of it. It kept popping, so I was trying to get back to my screen, and those watching, like, you're looking, to, yeah, I'm trying to... Get the thing off the screen so I can just deal with the calls. 866-348-7884. Okay, so 
a quick update. I really have nothing new to share regarding our situation with YouTube. Quick, quick recap. Uh, a few weeks back, they banned our video exposing the anti-Semitism of Catholic scholar E. Michael Jones. Now, we did not receive a strike for that, but they banned it for hate speech. So for us exposing hate speech, we got a video banned. So we, knew, we now have a new category. We put them on our website on sdrbrown.org called Too Hot for YouTube. We've got three videos so far, but who knows how many the number it will be. Uh, we've had uh, 250, 300 demonetized, but the E. Michael Jones one was the first one banned. Then one week later, so eight days ago, to our absolute shock, YouTube removed, before it could even go live, removed, or no, excuse me, removed a video that we had had on for, for some days that was getting a, a lot of responses, but getting a ton of responses from anti-Semites and Jew haters. I'm talking about ugly, 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 ugly stuff, all right? That got removed for hate speech. As, as we exposed the hate speech of True News or the anti-Semitism of True News, Obviously, a lot of people complain, the, the anti-Semites and Jew haters complain, as a result of which we, we get a strike against us, which banned us from live streaming for a week, banned us from uploading new videos. And we had a lot of new videos ready anyway that had already uploaded, but banned us. So that's why we couldn't put the radio show up every day or broadcast on YouTube. We appealed immediately. They acknowledged, received the appeal. But for the first time ever, they've not responded to the appeal. So we have a strike against us right now. Three strikes, you're banned for life from YouTube. Anyway, God's testing YouTube more than us. Go right now to our digital library. That's Ask Dr. Brown, askdrbrown.org for our YouTube videos. Too hot for YouTube. You know, we've heard for years now, love is love. Love wins. And I have the right to marry the one I love. And, and maybe you know a gay couple, maybe family members or friends, and they really seem to love each other. Maybe they're raising kids. They love their kids. They're devoted to each other just like a heterosexual couple. You say, surely, love should just accept that and embrace that. And, and many, even, even professing gay Christians, would point to Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Romans chapter 13, verse 10. And that tells us that love does no harm to its neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. So if I know that telling my neighbor that homosexual practice is sin is going to hurt them, aren't I harming them? If God is love, won't he affirm a loving relationship? All right, let me make this clear. The reason that Scripture opposes homosexual practice and homosexual relations is because God is love. And because God is love, he wants what is best for us. And he didn't make a man to be with a man or a woman to be with a woman. They may be loving, they may be kind, they may be devoted to each other, but God did not make men for men or women for women. God has something better. The first thing is for people to truly know him as Savior and find forgiveness of sins, whatever those sins might be. The second is to find wholeness and completeness in him. I know folks who used to be practicing homosexuals who are now happily married heterosexuals. I know others that used to be practicing homosexuals that are now celibate. They haven't seen a change in their desires, but they love the Lord and they've crucified the flesh and they're fulfilled as single believers. This much I know. If I affirm homosexual practice, if I tell that couple, God bless you, I want to affirm you as a follower of Jesus, I am not helping them, I'm hurting them. The relationship is wrong in God's sight. The relationship is not the best that God has for them. And ultimately, if they come to understand that God is against it, now they're living in open, willful sin. And Scripture makes very plain that those who practice adultery, those who practice fornication, those who practice drunkenness, those who practice homosexuality, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So out of love for those who identify as gay, we tell them God has a better way. And we say, no, he does not bless homosexual practice. You may have desires, you may struggle with those desires, but God does not affirm them. Instead, he says there is forgiveness for every sin committed and there is grace to overcome and lead a life of holiness. And that 
is the life that will be blessed, a holy life by God's grace. God of light, hear our cry, send the fire. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back to our Thoroughly Jewish Thursday broadcast. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you. 866-34-TRUTH. Often on Thursdays, always on Fridays, but often on Thursdays, our phone lines are jammed with callers with Jewish-related questions. And sometimes it's hard to get through. Fridays often very difficult to get through from beginning to end of the show, so we, we get to as many callers as, as we possibly can. But we happen to have... Some open lines, which often does not happen on a Thursday. So I want to invite you. Now's a great time to call with your Jewish-related questions. 866-348-7884. Jewish-related, Israel-related, Hebrew-related. That all fits on a thoroughly Jewish Thursday. I just tweeted something out. And I said this. Our heart as a nonprofit ministry is to reach and impact people. So we raise money to do it. If we were for profit, if we were a for profit organization, our goal would be to reach and impact people to make money. It's the opposite with us. Our whole vision to expand, to reach more people, to put out more quality material, our whole vision and reason for doing that is to touch lives for the glory of God, to reach Jewish people with the good news of Yeshua. We have some amazing opportunities presenting themselves before us in Israel to partner with some key workers and to to play a lead role. It all requires funding to do it. There is a great burden to get my materials out more fully, relevant ones, in Hebrew in Israel. We have very limited translated into Hebrew so far. There's a great vision and burden to do that. It takes funds to do it. For me to go over to to Israel and to pour in there takes funds to do it. To train and raise up others takes funds. To be on the air with you here takes funds. So as we appeal for funds, the whole goal is the opposite of a for-profit company or organization. The whole goal is to raise more funds to touch more people. And our whole team and staff work together sacrificially, working in in ways that they give themselves to, to the cause in order to help us reach people with the good news of Messiah. Here's a great way that you can all partner with us, all right? Just want to say this one more thing, and then we're going to open up the Hebrew Scriptures. Are you going to like this? Trust me. You're going to get something out of this. A great way that you can participate with us for just pennies a day is to become a Patreon supporter. We know if you're a member of a local congregation, you're, you're probably giving there. You might be tithing there regularly. There may be other ministries you support. That Maybe you, you help with a compassion ministry and sponsor a child overseas and you help with missionaries. It's wonderful. Don't, don't take a dime away from that, please. No. But with Patreon for just pennies a day, if we get enough people, it makes a massive difference. So like 30 cents or something per day, American cents, right? 30 cents a day, roughly $10 or more a month. You become a full-blown partner and you get two bonus videos every week. Uh, right now I'm recording a series on Hebrews that you'll be getting as a Patreon partner. And then once a week, we do a YouTube chat, a Q&A chat. And as soon as it's done, we archive it privately, but you get to see it as a Patreon supporter. So you're helping us put out more cutting edge material. We'd love to do more radio time. We'd love to to expand that onto internet in video form. There's so much we want to do, but we do it with your partnership. So if you can help, that would be amazing. That You have no idea. Everybody does their part. And instead of having 167 Patreon supporters, we have 1,067, and there's so much more we're able to do to bless you and reach Jewish people and beyond with the good news. So thank you. Here's where you go. It is patreon.com forward slash ask Dr. Brown. Patreon.com forward slash ask Dr. Brown. A-S-K-D-R Brown. By the way, we have things set up that the moment you become a Patreon supporter, we get an email notification. So 
you do it, and we'll be boom, bing, getting the pings in the background. I, I won't hear it, but uh, other team members will. And we'll, we'll let you know that you just joined us. So we'll feel it. Just if you're, if you're not driving, just take out your cell phone and go ahead and do that. All right, 866-34-TRUTH. Before I go to the phones, I want to open up to you the scriptures. And we want to go into 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating passage that, that I want to take a look at with you, all right? And it, it's talking about King Asa, all right? King Asa was a, a godly king. And when you read the, the previous two chapters, here's, here's what happens, all right? Uh, and, and we'll leave the text up there. This is from the Sfaria website. So it's the Hebrew text followed by the English. So in, in the, the 14th chapter of Second Chronicles, it tells us how King Asa was attacked by an overwhelming army. There's no way they could fight against them. So he earnestly sought the Lord. So in Hebrew, it's darash to seek. He sought the Lord and God delivered him. So now it tells us in the 15th chapter how he made it an edict throughout Israel that whoever didn't seek the Lord would die. Doesn't mean you had to pray a certain number of hours a day. It meant that you had to turn away from all other gods and idols and just worship the Lord and just seek the Lord. So now chapter 16 all right, this is later in his reign. He's had peace for many years. In the 36th year of the reign of, of Asa, King Basha of Israel marched against Judah and built up Ramah to block all movement of King Asa of Judah. Asa took all the silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord, the royal palace, sent them to King Ben-Hadad of Aram, who resided in Damascus, with a message, hey, help us. So this is, this is a real shocker, all right, a real shocker. Instead of relying on the Lord like he did before, instead of trusting the Lord like he did all these years earlier, instead of building on the godly heritage that he had, instead, he took things from the Lord's treasury, right? It, it would be like you, you've been giving money to, to your congregation for years, and they're going to build a new center to, to, to help the homeless and the indigent in your city. And now something comes up, and they take that money and use it to, to hire some PR firm to fight against some bad press. It's like, that... That was designated money. You don't play with the Lord's money. So not only does he do that, but he hires out a pagan king to fight his battles instead of leaning on the Lord. So let's go back to the chapter. Uh, we skip down uh, a few verses, and we see beginning in verse, uh, it, well, it tells us what happened and how the other king intervened, etc. Then it says, beginning verse 7, at that time, Hanani, the seer came to King Asa of Judah and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Aram and did not rely on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has slipped out of your hands. You made a deal with him. You were supposed to judge him. The Cushites and Libyans were a mighty army with chariots and horsemen in very great numbers. That's chapter 14. Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hands. And then a verse I love to quote in Hebrew, Ki Adonai, for the Lord, Enav meshotetot bechol haaretz. His eyes go back and forth through the whole earth. To stand in strong support of those whose hearts are wholly his. All right, then he says, you've acted foolishly in this matter, and henceforth you'll be beset by wars. Asal was vexed by the seer and put him into the stocks, for he was furious with him because of that. Asal inflicted cruelties on some of the people at that time. The acts of Asal early and later recorded in the annals of the king of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa suffered from an acute foot ailment, right? So it says in Hebrew, So he suffers from this in his feet. He's, in the 39th year of his reign, he gets sick in his feet, in an extreme way, all right? That's how bad it is. That his, his sickness was extreme. But then it says this, but even in his sickness, he didn't seek the Lord, but rather the physicians. Now, I focused on this in my doctoral dissertation decades ago because it's a verse about healing, and it's a verse that was used and has been used over the years to say it's wrong to go to doctors. That's unbelief. You just seek the Lord for healing. And look what happened to Asa. He died. Well, if you put trust in an earthly doctor and reject faith in God, that's, that's a problem. But doctors are here to help. Doctors are here to support God's program, which is healing. They're on God's side in that respect. Hospitals are on God's side in that respect, fighting against sickness and disease, etc. 
But what happens here? The Hebrew is very precise and a few interesting things. When you say darash with a direct object, so to seek the Lord in Hebrew, darash et Adonai, to seek the Lord, that is to, to go after him and worship, to look to him, to trust in him, all right? If you say darash be with an indirect object and a certain preposition, be, that means to consult in an oracular fashion. Darash be the foreign gods, darash be the, the sorcerers, all right? And it says here that Asa did not seek the Lord, but rather, so he did not darash et seek the Lord, direct object, but rather darash be, indirect object, the physicians, which would indicate, and most likely pagan physicians, but certainly idolatrous physicians, certainly physicians who were not true Yahweh worshipers. In other words, the idiom is telling us that he, rather than sought the Lord for healing, instead he went to idolatrous physicians. He, he, that, that is the idiom that's being used. And the fact that the verb is used twice in the same verse, once with a direct object and once with the indirect object, is telling you. It doesn't mean rather than seek help from the Lord, he said, sought help from medical doctors. No, rather than seek help from the Lord, he sought oracular help from pagan physicians. And, and we know, or ungodly physicians, we know that it was very common among physicians in ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia. It was very common for them to also be priests of various gods. And they would rely on these various potions, which, which would have then blessing of the deity and those kinds, you know, all, it is a mixture. Here's the utter irony. Asa's name is a short form of a name that would have originally been something like Asaya or Asael. But Asa itself means healed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or healer, Asya would be physician. So rather than leaning on the Lord for his healing, this man whose name probably originally was God heals, Yahweh heals, right? Maybe his mother was sick and unable to bear, conceive, and she gave birth, or maybe she had a hard pregnancy, whatever, or maybe someone had been healed and they wanted to commemorate it. His name was originally something like God or Yahweh heals. And, and what happens instead of leaning on the Lord, he failed to lean on the Lord when he was attacked by enemies. Now he failed to lean on the Lord even in extreme sickness and instead made oracular consultation with physicians. What an irony with a man whose name is God or Yahweh healed. Wow. So some insights from the Hebrew Bible on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. We'll be right back. I've heard it over and over and over again. Today's Jews are not really Jews. Today's Jews are just Ashkenazi. They're converts of the Khazar kingdom. They're European. They're not really Jews. And the real Jews are either Africans or the real Jews are Christians because God's done with natural Israel. Well, well what is this based on? Some of it's based on just the latest misinformation and internet myths and things like that. Some of it's based on the good research that traces back Jewish origins and recognizes that there's been Jewish intermarriage over the centuries. That's why we come in so many different colors and shapes and forms. But, but this idea that today's Jews are not really Jews or that even if Ashkenazi Jews or other Jews are ethnically Jewish, that they're not Jews in God's sight, it's based on a misreading of Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Paul is writing in Romans, and look at what he says in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all who are of Israel are Israel. What was the point that Paul was making? He spoke from Romans 9, 1 to 5 of the anguish that he carried in his heart, the constant pain and anguish that he carried in his heart for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to whom the promises of God remain. He says, theirs are, not were, but theirs are the promises, all right? But he says, well, it's not as though the word of God failed because the Messiah came and the promised nation didn't 
follow, does that mean the word of God failed because God made these promises to Israel? And his first response is, no, not everyone descended from Israel is Israel. He's not talking about the church as a whole. He's not talking about the Gentile world. He's not talking about everyone else. He's saying that there is a remnant within the nation, just as he says in first uh, in Romans 11, 1, uh, the, the, he responds to that again, points out, hey, I'm, I'm an Israelite. I'm part of the remnant. So he's saying within the nation, there is an Israel within Israel, an Israel within Israel that has received the Messiah to whom... Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the Line of Fire, 866-34-TRUTH on this 30 Jewish Thursday. I've got an important announcement to make to all of our friends in the New York City area. And if you missed the news, we now have Jezebel's War with America. We got our copies to sign and send out in advance. Comes out August 6th. If you haven't pre-ordered yet, it's a bestseller already on Amazon. We've never had uh, expectation like this for a book coming out. There seems to be something going on, folks praying and fasting for its impact on the nation. So we're just looking to the Lord to do something through this. Go to JezebelsWarWithAmerica.com, pre-order today, and get over $50 of free eBooks and materials when you do. JezebelsWarWithAmerica.com. In fact, if you prefer eBooks, then order the book by pre-ordering. And give away the hardcover and just keep the ebook because you get the ebook free when you pre order. All right, over to John. I was going to John in California, but tell you what, tell you what, we'll stay in New York for a minute. Uh, Let's just put up this headline. There is an article in Jewish Press, so Orthodox Jewish publication, Shmuli Boteach to debate Jew for Yushka on New Testament anti Semitism. And it's got a picture of Rabbi Shmuley, older picture of him, actually. So he looks a lot younger there. Uh, and a picture of me from my testimony on One for Israel. Glad to see that. And, of course, there's nothing good about me and nothing good about debates. And it's positive on Shmuley. But we're thrilled. Chosen people hosting this debate is thrilled. The debate will be August 8th in New York City in Manhattan. Admission is free. Details on our website, askdrbrown, askdrbrown.org. Just click on itinerary there, and you will see the details. Love to see you. Love to greet you there in New York City. But you say, what's that Yushka thing? That's the way a traditional Jew would say the name of Jesus. They will not actually pronounce his name. To them, it's like profanity. You say, that's terrible. Yes, it's terrible. It's ugly. They have no clue who he is. Now, those who do and are sitting with their eyes open are all the more accountable, and they're going to have to answer to God for that. But for many, they just think of Jesus as this this Jewish guy that went astray, that led Israel into idolatry, that you can trace a straight line from the New Testament to the Holocaust. That's what a lot of them believe. And that's one purpose of having this debate, to dispel the the myths and correct them with facts. But I've had people refer to him as JC. I've heard people refer to him as Yushka and then spit on the ground. This is part of what we're up against when it comes to reaching the very religious Jews. And yet, as sure as I'm sitting here, I know that God's going to open their hearts, that God's going to give repentance, and that many will turn to the Messiah in the days ahead. How? That's God's business. But the certainty of it, I'm sure. I'm sure. And by God's grace, we're involved in the front lines helping to see that happen. So if you're anywhere near New York City, if you have to drive a few hours, I think it'd be worth your time August 8th. Uh, all right, let's go over to Rich in Demora, Iowa. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Yes, I have a question. Rega- I have a question regarding end times and the tribulation, and then going into the millennium. Yeah. One of the evangelical people that I've read says that everybody entering the millennium will be Christians coming out of the tribulation. I'm wondering how that can be if after the rapture everybody's taken out of this earth, and it seems like it would be only unsaved people that are left, how can everybody that goes into the millennium be believers? Yeah, uh, well, I don't, I don't agree that they'll all be believers either. Now, Rich, I don't hold to a pre-trib rapture, so that would make it even more acute from my viewpoint. I believe at the end of the tribulation period, when Jesus returns in glory, that we'll be caught up to meet him then, 
And rather than him turning around and going back to heaven, we turn around and escort him back to earth in our glorified bodies, at which time he destroys the armies attacking Jerusalem and, and, and destroys the wicked with the breath of his mouth, coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God. I'm giving you some of the language of Isaiah 11 and, and 2 Thessalonians 1. But what we have ex explicitly, Rich, is in Zechariah chapter 14, that the survivors of the nations that attack Jerusalem will enter the millennial kingdom. It doesn't say they're Christians. They are the survivors of the nations. I believe all true believers will have been caught up to meet the Lord at his return. So it is the survivors of the nations. So those that did not engage in the hostile acts against Jerusalem. And it could well be that Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, speak of this as well. That's possible. The judgment of the sheep and the goats by nation. Now, there's obviously a message being taught in that parable. But this could also be referring to it that those who treated the Jewish people kindly during this time of persecution or treated all believers, followers of Jesus, kindly during this time of persecution, rather than being believers themselves, that they will enter the millennial kingdom. So, sir, it's not the outright wicked, rebellious, hostile to God, hostile to Israel, hostile to God's people, uh, uh, individuals who will enter the millennial kingdom, but rather those who are not part of that, but not yet born again believers. That also explains why the Lord will rule with a rod of iron during the millennial kingdom and why at the end of it, there will still be a mass rebellion despite being here on a perfect earth. Hey, thank you, or a, a righteous earth led by Jesus himself. Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> before I go back to the phones, we put out a video on Facebook. Uh, is it up on YouTube, guys? Do, do we have it now? Okay, just went live on YouTube. Uh, Pastor Stephen Anderson, notorious for his rejoicing in the death of homosexuals and a militant King James-only preacher. Uh, I've got great appreciation for the King James, but I'm not King James-only. He's militant King James-only. He actually has a video mocking the name Yeshua, uh, mocking the Hebrew name, actually mocking the Hebrew language, Aramaic language, mocking the way it sounds. Uh, so we put out a video responding to that. We put it out on Facebook originally because we couldn't upload it onto YouTube. It's, it's live on YouTube now. It's gotten, what, oh, tens of thousands of, of views over on, on YouTube. But I just got a note, excuse me, on Facebook. I just got a note from someone on Facebook. Hi, Pastor Michael. I saw your post about Pastor mocking the name of Yeshua. Sadly, the same spirit operates here in Latvia through some missionary from the USA, and he sent me a link. Isn't that wild? Isn't that wild? So check out that video of a pastor mocks Yeshua's Jewish roots. Uh, you can see it on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page. That's Ask Dr. Brown, A-S-K, D-R Brown. All right, uh, let's go to Shirley in Raleigh, North Carolina. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. Um, I enjoy your program. Thank you. Um, and it's very interesting. I'm interested in knowing what uh, Jewish scholars, particularly maybe in the the, the century surrounding uh, Jesus' uh, appearance, mm -hmm. uh, what is their commentary or explanation about the uh, third angel that visited Abraham and, say, the, the fourth um, man in the furnace and, and other theophanies? Yeah, so, so surely they, they would not normally see them as theophanies, divine appearances. They had a very developed angelology. They taught ex extensively, not, not all the Jewish groups, but some did, uh, taught extensively about different angels and all types of, of, of hierarchical ranking among the angels and believed that there was one angel who was the supreme angel of all called Metatron, and, and sometimes he could even be referred to as Yahweh or the lesser Yahweh because his name was as his master. That's how closely he represented him. Uh, there's other uh, literature where Enoch becomes Metatron. Uh, Enoch is glorified into this angelic form. Uh, as for the angel of the Lord, Malach Adonai, the angel of the Lord, who appears, for example, in Genesis 16, Genesis 22, uh, Exodus, the third chapter, and other key times, 
uh, there is recognition about the uniqueness of this angel who in a unique way bears God's name and bears God's image uh, and yet is not God. Now, there are some who argue, surely, that the developed angelology of first century Judaism was such that it could now conceive of Jesus Yeshua as a highly exalted being, although not God himself. And others would say, actually, there was even some angelic worship, but generally speaking, Judaism would categorically speak against worship of an angel, although recognizing that the most highly exalted angels represented God. They were literal representatives of Yahweh and bore his name. Uh, Genesis 18 is read in later Jewish tradition as three angels who were visiting, uh, visiting Abraham, one of whom was Raphael, the healing angel, because Abraham had been circumcised in the previous chapter. And the other, uh, there was another that was Gabriel because he's the one bringing announcements of good messages, good news, things like that. So that's how it's understood. Very interesting. Uh, a bridge through which we can now open up and say, no, 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 this is actually a theophany or a Christophany. This is the Messiah appearing. This is a divine angel. And, and surely check out Genesis 48, verses 15 and 16. That's the clearest text on this. Genesis 48, verses 15 and 16, where Jacob references the God who helped him, the God who redeemed him, the angel who delivered him, the God, the God, the angel, and then says, now bless my grandsons. He appeals to God, God, the angel as one and says, bless these boys. So clearly this divine angel. Hey, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us on Patreon. We appreciate your support. Patreon.com forward slash ask Dr. Brown.